up a catalog, preachers and pastors. I said we're opening up a catalog, preachers and pastors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. Good morning. We are ready to get started this morning and glad that you're here. Uh, we have a few guests with us today as we have for each of our, our sessions this weekend and we're thankful that you're here. Um, we've had a, uh, a good series of meetings and uh, in a lot of ways I hate to see it end today. Uh, but uh, end it will, and we are the better for having had it. And uh, grateful to Eric and Vanessa for coming our way and for helping us in the way that they have the last couple of days. Um, before we uh, uh, before we begin the, the the main part of our of our worship, David Hamrick is going to be leading our singing uh, this morning, and. Uh, at the appropriate time, Larry McWilliams, a former member here, a current member at the Granbury um, Street uh, Congregation in Cleburne, uh, will lead us in prayer. Uh, and But before we do that, I'm going to ask Stephen Alexander uh, to uh, come forward and lead us in prayer for, for a special um, matter. Uh, some of you may have seen this this morning the, on our Faith Life page, but I... Um, was talking to Chuck uh, Cardenas this morning, and um, uh, his wife, Laura, is uh, in the hospital uh, in ICU, 
uh, in Mansfield uh, with blood clots uh, in her leg and lung. Uh, and uh, she had been feeling poorly for a couple of weeks, he said, and, and then last night um, got really short of breath and so took her to ER and that's what they've discovered. And so they were, when I talked to him this morning, a little after eight, uh, they were waiting for a cardiologist uh, to come in and uh, decide what the treatment uh, would be. And so he said he would keep us posted, but uh, he wanted for the church to know and uh, certainly wanted us to, uh, to mention her in prayer. And we are honored to do that. So Stephen, uh, would you come and lead us in prayer on Laura's behalf? And then after that, we'll turn the service over to David. Let's pray. Our kind and merciful Father in heaven, we are humbled to bow before your majestic throne, knowing, Father, that you are the one true and living God from everlasting to everlasting. We are mindful of your amazing power, your unlimited knowledge grace, mercy, and love, and we stand in awe of you. We cannot praise you enough. There are just not enough words for us to express how grateful we are for you. Father, we bow before you this morning on behalf of our sister Laura, who's in a hospital battling, battling some blood clots and and Father, we know that that's a, that's a serious thing. We're grateful that you allow us the advances in medicine and, and, and knowledge at this point in time that we can combat that, that we've got good doctors, good men and women that are watching over her. And we pray, Father, for your blessings to be upon them as they care for Laura we pray, Father, that they will be sharp and focused, uh, totally dialed in to what she needs and the best course of action for her. And, uh, and we pray, Father, for, for a good plan to come forth today uh, for, for them. We pray that you'll bless her, um, be with Chuck and, and the family, and uh, I know that they're so very concerned, help them Help them to be able to feel our, our love and encouragement, uh, even though we're not physically with them at this moment. Uh, we pray, Father, for, for Laura, and we pray that we'll have a, uh, a, good, a good plan going forward here soon. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for Eric and for his willingness to come here and, and bring, us a, uh, bring us lessons from your word, and we're appreciative of him grateful for him and pray your blessings upon him as he does just that here in a few moments. Be with us now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our first song will be, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't seem like a good sign, does it? Good morning. Our first song will be Holy, Holy, Holy. 238 in the hymnal.
on Zion's glorious summit, number 515. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. oh. Would you bow with me, please? Holy Father, we are grateful for this time. We can come before you and, and praise you and laud you and give you the credit due you for all that we have and are blessed with in our lives. Help us to be mindful, Father, of your Son, how committed he was in his life to serve you, honor you, and glorify you, and to esteem us, to help us to know that we have value. We know, Father, that we have work to do here. And we pray that you would be with us as we serve you in sharing your word with others. May they be blessed with that word and accept it. May we recognize its power and not our own, for we have none without you. I'm thankful, Father, for Eric and uh, his coming and sharing with us about you, about your joyful uh, love for us, 
and about happiness and how we as Christians can have that in our lives each and every day. Pray, Father, your blessings upon him as he speaks to us this morning and your blessings to all of us as we speak to others about you and your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. <coughs> Before the lesson, we'll sing these two songs back to back and repeating the first one again. We've done that that way at Brown Trail a few times. It is good to see you here this morning. As always, we are very thankful for your presence and thankful again for the invitation to be here and study uh, this weekend with you. Uh, I have heard about Brown Trail for many years and uh, have never been here. And uh, it's been so encouraging for us to come. And we're thankful for your faithfulness that has continued through the years for all of those who've come before and continue now. It has just been a treat to be with you. And we uh, are very thankful for your encouragement to us. Vanessa and I are very grateful and we covet your prayers. I'm saying all that so I don't have to in the last session. We'll just jump right into that one. <laughs> but we do want you to know how much we've appreciated being here with you. We've been progressing through the material and I've kind of tried to remember the material in the book. And so we've been talking about why ultimately we're not finding it here. Why we cannot find joy and happiness here on this earth. It's not here. It's not under the sun. So we've, we've tried to make that abundantly clear. And last night we turned our attention to uh, the failings of false religion and why that fails. And so uh, ultimately this also is part of the problem that in that kind of religion we, we 
actually have some misplaced expectations of God. That's really what happens. When people come into a relationship with God, they are expecting something because they've been told certain things. And so they grow to expect that that's what will happen. But the problem is the religion is theirs. And since it's our religion, we kind of decide and dictate what God should and should not do. And that's what brings us to the question, do we serve God or does God serve us? This morning we'll study about a man who suffered from misplaced expectations and he sought to make God serve him instead of becoming God's servant and the result of that is the relationship almost failed before it began. If you have your Bibles and you turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, you'll meet that man. You know his name. His name is Naaman. And we began by noting about Naaman that he is a great man with a great problem. And the first four verses of the chapter explain that to us. The Bible says Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Syria. The Bible says he was a great man. Now listen, if the Bible calls you a great man, that means you're a great man. There's really no other way to slice that. In fact, Solomon says about himself on one occasion, so I was great. And again, if it's, bra if, if it's true, it's not bragging. Uh, Solomon was great. Naaman is great. That's not a problem. That's just what the Bible says. He was a great man. He was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to, the, to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. You see, you can be a great man and have a great problem, and he does. He was a leper. Now, the Bible goes on to say the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Oh, that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord thus, and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. Now, it's important to understand that every time you're reading the Bible, you're reading about God. And even when God is not immediately mentioned, he's there. He's in the background. He's moving the things forward. It is ultimately about him. And even here, without so much as a word, it might be possible to see God's grace, maybe God's providence. You see, when Naaman and Syria came and, and defeated Israel, of all the people in all the world, they took a little girl. And it just so happened that that little girl knew about the prophet. Why that little girl? I have no idea. But isn't it good for Naaman that the girl that they have in their house, that little maid, who waits on his wife is the little maid that has the words, oh, that my master were with the prophet in Israel. He would cure him of his leprosy. It would be great if the very next thing we read was, and so he was cured, but it's not. No, Naaman has some missteps. And there in verses 5 down to verse number 8, what did she say? Oh, that my master were with the prophet. What did he do? Verse number 5, then, then the king of Amram said, Go now. Verse number four says, Naaman went and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Who is his master? The king. Verse number five. After the king hears from Naaman, then the king says, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and gold, shekels of gold, and ten chains of clothing. He brought the letter to the king of Israel. And now as the letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him from his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive this man to send any word to cure me, a man of his leprosy? But consider now, he is seeking a quarrel against me. What do I mean by missteps? It's not what she said. She didn't say, Oh, that my master were with the king in Israel. That's not what she said. She said, oh, that my master with the prophet in Israel, he would cure him. Instead of seeking the prophet, Naaman went to his master, his king. When his king heard the word, he wrote a letter to the king of Israel. And he said to the king of Israel, when I send my master and he gets there, you cure him. Well, the king of Israel gets that letter and says, wait a minute. He knows I can't cure leprosy. In fact, this is a ruse. It's not even about cleansing leprosy. He is using this to seek a quarrel of war because when I fail, he'll use that as an indication to attack us. 
And so verse number eight, the Bible says, it happened when Elijah, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes and he sent word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman finally does now go and see the prophet. To Naaman, unfortunately, God was a great disappointment. When I say misplaced expectations, when I ask, do we serve God or does God serve us? This is the indication of that. Verse number nine began, so Naaman came with his horses, with his chariots, and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought, he would surely come out to me, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. You, you will want to read that close, and please, as you read the Bible, do get the sense and the feel of what's happening. How did we open with Naaman? The Bible says he was a great man. Guess who else knows he's a great man? Naaman knows he's a great man. And now that he has arrived at the house or the tent of the prophet, Naaman has expectations. Because of the greatness that I am, I already know how this is going to work. How's it going to work out, Naaman, when I arrive? With what? With my horses and my display of my greatness. When I arrive, then he will come out to me. And when he sees me, he'll see the leprosy, and then he will wave his hands over the leprous area, and then he will call out to his God, and then I will be healed. It didn't work out that way at all. You see, the prophet didn't even come. In fact, he sent a servant. Can you imagine the gall? of not even coming to stand before me? You're going to send a servant with a message? And what's the message? Go dip in the dirty Jordan seven times. Me? His expectations of God were not realized. And as a result of that, he was genuinely disappointed. So much so that the Bible says Naaman was wroth, strong King James language for absolutely upset, angry, wroth, and he went away. He went away. Naaman said, if it's not going to be done the way I thought it would be, I won't even be cleansed. I will take my leprosy and go home. How dare you not do what I... This is the disposition of name. And friends, I submit to you, this is more typical of material religion than it's not. In fact, we might ask ourselves, those listening beyond these walls might ask themselves, how's my approach to God? Am I like Naaman? If we were to ask, how would you say your and God's relationship is going? Sometimes I ask people that, how are you and God doing? If you were asked the question, how's it going with you and God? How's the relationship going? You see, you and I might offer an answer. What if we turn the question and ask this, how would God say it's going? Let's ask another question. If you were answering, what is the basis of your answer? What would you use to decide how the relationship is going between you and God? And further, is it the same thing God would use? If God were given an answer, what would be the basis for the answer he would give? I can assure you this, it's not our thoughts. It's not our feelings. It's not our desires. From God's perspective, the relationship that you, I, and anyone sustains with him, the basis of that relationship would be his word. You see, his word is the source of knowledge of God. We couldn't even know him without his word. 
We could know that he is, Psalm 19, Hebrews 3, 4. We could know that he is, Romans 1, his divine nature, Acts 14. He's not left himself without witness. We could know that he is, but we couldn't know him. We couldn't know his mind. We couldn't know what he wants out of the relationship, from the relationship. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 13 makes this abundantly clear. Speaking of God's plans, purposes, the mystery, the revelation that he unfolds, Paul says, for what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. Just prior to that, he says, what no eye has seen, what no ear heard, and what no mind has imagined, the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. And since you and I don't have the capacity to read one another's mind, no man knows the thoughts and things of another man except that man's spirit. Paul then moves from the lesser to the greater, and he says, since you and I can't read each other's mind, nobody can read God's mind. Let me ask you this. How would you know? How would you know what God wants from the relationship? Paul says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, the concept, the idea of, think about an ocean and the depths, plummeting the depths of the ocean. Now make that the mind of God. Who knows the deep things, the mind, the depth, breath, width, scope of God's mind? Who knows that? Nobody but God. And Paul says the Spirit revealed it. The way you come to know God is his word. How would you even know where to begin with the relationship? What basis would you use for how things are going in the relationship? The word of God is objective truth. John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let me ask you this. Where would you go for the source of truth as it relates to God? What book would you use? You have his mind revealed. It is the objective truth, and Jesus would say it is the basis of judgment. When you stand before God, what is going to be used to judge whether or not you're going to come into heaven or go to hell eternally? It's not your thoughts. Jesus says in John 12, 48, He that rejected me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. You see, here's the reality. If we don't know God's word, we cannot have a successful relationship with him. Naaman's thoughts almost prevented his cleansing. And your thoughts will do the same. Why can't people have a successful relationship with God and therefore find joy? There are two major problems hurting people's relationship with God. Number one, preachers are not preaching God's word faithfully. They are often preaching their thoughts, often alleging and subjecting that they have gotten revelation today or last night. That God has revealed something beyond his word, although the faith has been once for all delivered, Jude 3. And although the scripture is absolutely all sufficient, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And that if anyone says anything more than the gospel or less than the gospel, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, you ought to reject them and may they be accursed. And yet people show up to pulpits as if they talked to God yesterday and God sat across the coffee table and told them something that's not in this book. They go right out on a stage just like this one and shout to the world, God laid this on my heart. He did not. You made that up. Preachers don't preach God's word faithfully, but that's only one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is people don't study God's word personally. Often being told they can't understand it or being told that they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to reveal or enlighten them. In the end, the only way you can know God's word, God, God himself and his, him, his, his word, it, it gets set aside and put down. Now, the one source of knowledge of one's relationship with God gets set aside, and people try to have a relationship with him based largely on their thoughts, their feelings, and the last thing their preacher made up. And so we ask, do we serve God, or does God serve us? Who is in control, God or Naaman? You or God? Is God our servant or are we his? When God is our servant, it looks like this. And this is the way people talk, religious people. I have a problem in my life. You know what I'll do with it? I'll just turn it over to God. It's an often used phrase in religion. What are you going to do with your problems in life? I'm going to turn them over to God. 
What are you going to do with that person in your life? I'm going to turn them over to God. In fact, people turn everything and everybody over to God. Do we follow his word? Nope, we just turn it over to God. Do we seek his counsel? Nope, we just turn it over to God. It's important to understand that God is not a doorman waiting to serve us. Somebody might quote 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, 7 here, where the Bible says, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the disposition of name, and that's so prevalent in religious people. Treating God like a doorman or a cleaner that we drop off things to and then demand that he clean them up so we can make them dirty again. While completely abandoning any thoughts of doing what he says in his word. For instance, in God's first address to humanity in the flesh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 9, you know what Jesus says? He says, develop a character. Develop your character to be like my character. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. You know what God wants you to do? Develop your character to be like him, Matthew 5, 3 through 9. But further than that, God says, add to your faith. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7, don't just become a Christian and stop, no sir, no ma'am. Choreograph, let this dance out of all of these things, grow out of your faith. Lead one, bleed right into another. Add to your faith knowledge, and the knowledge temperance, the temperance faith, and the brotherly kindness. And let all of that flow out. But we say no. God says further, why don't you take the seed of God's word and grow the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22 to 24. And when religious people say no, 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 and no, instead, I'll just turn it over to God. Character issues? Yes. Anger issues? Yes. Lustful issues? Yes. Why don't you do what God says? No. I'm just going to turn it over to God. Relationships issues? Yes. Why don't you just do what God says? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, obey. No, 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 and no. Why don't you do what God says? But you're going to turn it over to God. So don't deny yourself. Don't humble yourself. Don't submit yourself. Just turn it over to God. When we're not turning things over to God, we're offering prayers to God. Somebody told us that's a great idea. Something wrong in your life? I'll just pray about it. And very often religious people do mean that. I'll just pray about it. People who don't read the Bible would be surprised to find out what the Bible says about prayer. You know, sometimes this is the case. Prayer is not the answer. If you'd like to see an example of that, turn to Joshua chapter 7. Listen to God talk to Joshua, a praying man, a man, in fact, in prayer, when the conversation ensues. In Joshua chapter 7, Verse number seven, Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan? Only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say? Israel has turned their back before their enemies. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it. They will surround us, cut off our name from the earth. And what will it do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban. And they have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from their midst. If you are familiar with the context, you know this is about Achan stealing the Babylonian garments and gold and shekels and, and taking it and hiding it in the earth under his tent. And Joshua, when they lose the battle of Ai, Joshua is completely confused. How did we lose? In fact, we didn't even send the whole army. It was a little group of people. We didn't need much. And yet Israel turned their backs and ran. How could that happen? You know what Joshua did? He prayed. Fell on his face. Prayed to God. You know what God said? Stop it. Prayer is not the answer here. There's sin in the camp. And so get up off of your face and go find out about the sin and fix it. And if you don't fix it, I won't be with you. 
It's an amazing thing when you read the Bible, what you will find in there. Prayer is not the answer for every single issue of life. Prayer is not the answer where sin and repentance is necessary. Repentance is the answer. And God teaches about prayer, but you'd have to study his word to know that. When we pray, John says, if it's to be answered, it must be according to his will, not yours. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. When James touches the subject, he says, if you're going to ask something of God, you ask believing, nothing doubting, no wavering, James 1, 5 through 8. James actually said you could pray and pray amiss so that you could squander it upon your own lust. Sometimes people never question why am I asking God for it in the first place? And what do I plan to do with it? James says you could ask for your own lust to consume it upon yourself and have nothing to do with God. And James says you won't get that. Peter says further, if you don't treat your wife right, your prayers will be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7 to 12. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto them as unto the weaker vessel, as heirs together of the grace of life, so that your prayers are not hindered. I suppose a man who doesn't read the Bible and has God as his servant might believe that he can mistreat his wife, come to worship, put on a happy face, go home and be a praying man and believe God's going to show up and answer. And yet, if he had read God's word, he would hear God saying, don't do that because your prayers will be hindered. We're told in Proverbs 28, 9, the one who turns his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. You're in a relationship with God. How's it going? How would he say it's going? What would you use as the basis of knowing how it's going? And then what would he use? And if it's his word and it is, what are you doing by way of what he said? Or do you just intend to disregard what God says and keep praying to God? Somebody has said that prayer is man talking to God and God's word is God talking to man. And so if you were to draw a circle, then you would have prayer at the bottom going up to God and God's word at the top coming down to man. You'd have a relationship in which both parties contribute and participate. But let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a relationship that's one-sided? A relationship where one person takes and takes and takes, and the other person gives and gives and gives. Where when one person talks, they demand that they be heard and obeyed and what they request be done instantly, while at the exact same time when the other person talks, it can be ignored, disobeyed, and completely rejected. Don't you love those relationships? Don't you look for those relationships? Can't you just not wait to be in one of those how many people have that relationship with God? The material religion fails because it sets God up for failure. When God is our servant, we make demands that he must fulfill. And so they talk just like this. You want a job? God will give you a job. You want a house? God will give you a house. You want a child? God will give you a baby. You want a spouse? God will give you a husband or a wife. You want a parking space, the Holy Spirit will give you one, especially during the holidays. If you don't want cancer, just don't claim it, and God will take it away. You know, that would be enough, I suppose, to demonstrate how terrible the nature of the relationship is, but we go a step further, and once God gives you what you ask for, we then demand that no harm ever befall. The sad reality is for many people, Satan is correct about the relationship they sustain with God. You can read Satan's suggestions in the book of Job, the first and second chapter. There you will find God and you will find the angels and you will find Satan among them. And then you will find Job, this man of, of faith and, 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 and righteousness and holiness in a relationship with God. Job will be described as a perfect and upright man just in his generations. 
He's also a wealthy man, but that has nothing to do with what Job actually thinks about God because the Bible uses his wealth as the and. It talks about Job's faith and life and his children and also his wealth. It's like the wealth is actually a third option, not even that important by way of his relationship with God. But Satan comes along, stands in the presence of God, and he says something like this. Do you think Job is serving you for no reason? Here's Satan's accusation toward God. You bought him. I mean, you've given him all of this stuff, and then you hedged him in. I can't even get to him. Of course he serves you, but know this, Satan to God, you're not actually worth serving. And in fact, if you took his things, I'll prove it to you. He'll curse you to your face. To which God says, okay. Touch and take his things, just don't touch him. You read the first book of Job, and over and over and over again, Job's things began to be taken away violently, by nature, by marauders. All of Job's things are taken away. You get to the end of chapter 1, and Job makes that great statement. Naked have I came from my mother's womb, and naked that I shall return thither. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I want to tell you, I am absolutely laudable of Job's attitude and disposition. I think it's laudable. But you should know Job's not exactly right. You see, Job doesn't know about the conversation that God and Satan had. And as a result of not knowing that, Job does believe that since God gave it, God could take it. The reality is God didn't take it. Satan took it. Now, Job doesn't know that. And we'll go all the way through the book with Job believing that. But even then, though he believes it, Job still does not curse God to his face. But then there's a second challenge, because Satan is a liar, and there is no truth in him. That's how our Lord described him, John 8, 44. And so Satan returns, and he says, yeah, okay, skin for skin. I was wrong about his stuff, but listen, if you touch his skin, all that a man have will he give for his skin. See what happens if you touch him. God says, okay, you can touch him, but don't kill him. In the rest of the book, we read of Job's suffering. You know, the sad reality is that while Satan was wrong about Job, he's right about most religious people. You see, people believe that God should give them everything they want. And as a result of that, now that he's given it to them, God should protect it. Nothing should ever happen to it. So what happens when something does happen to it? then they turn on the one who gave it. And how many people have ended their relationship with God because something bad happened in their life? How many people have given up on God because tragedy has struck them? Job lost 10 children. How many people have suffered the loss? Husband, wife, sister, brother, child. Oh, it's a terrible tragedy. I don't mean to make light of it. I'm simply saying, is that and was that the nature of your relationship with God? that you and God had made a deal that, one, he would give it to you, and two, nothing would ever happen to it, because that's exactly what Satan says. Do you think they serve you for nothing? They serve you for the stuff. They serve you for the possessions, and as a result of that, when God is our servant, that's the way we treat him. It's interesting, though, when God is our God and we are his servants, we go to his word and we read something completely different. For instance, if you want a job, God would say, go to work. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse number 10, a man would not work, neither should he eat. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 10, God would say, go to the ant, thou sluggard. Go to work. You want a job, go to work. That's what God would say to his servants. You want a house? Buy it. Proverbs 31 and 16, that, that virtuous woman and her husband, they were industrious people. You want a house? I know this. If you get the money, the banks and everybody will participate in your success. They want you to have it. Want a house? Get the job. Get the money. Buy the house. You want a spouse? Seek one. Be worthy of one. Find one. He who finds a wife. What did he do? Oh, God gave. No, he found her. Marriage is honorable in all, beds undefiled. 
You want a spouse? Go find one, Hebrews 13, 4. You want a child? Get married, have sex, everything being equal, have a child. What if we can't? Adopt a child. 1 Timothy talks about women who brought up children. Doesn't have to come from your body. You can still be a parent. Absolutely it's possible. That's what you would find in God's word. And when it comes to sickness, God has never made a promise that none of his children would get sick. In fact, Paul would argue otherwise. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. What does that mean? It's common. What's common? The trials of life, the challenges, the difficulties, everybody gets it. Could it happen to you? Yes. Has God ever said it could? No. Where would you get the idea? Maybe it's because you made God your servant. You see, when God is our servant, he makes physical promises. If you believe no harm will befall us, our loved ones will never get sick, no one will ever die, he'll give us lots of money, no one will ever do us wrong, all our family problems will be resolved, well, then God would be our servant indeed. But again, what God says to his servants is very different. God says, blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of things against you falsely for my name's sake, Matthew 5, 10 to 12. God says to his servants, if you live godly, you will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 12. God says, it's appointed unto men once to die after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. God is the one saying, your life is a vapor. It appears for a little time, then vanishes away, James 4 and verse number 14. God is the one saying, tomorrow is not promised. Don't boast yourself of that, Proverbs 27, 1. God is the one saying, and having food and raiment, let's be content, 1 Timothy 6, 10 to 17. There is an important truth to remember. We need God. He doesn't need us. I love what one preacher told me. He wasn't meaning to insult me, but this is what he said to me. He said, Eric, always remember, God can use you, but he doesn't need you. Jesus told those Jews, if God wanted to, he'd raise up stones. These rocks would praise him. Rocks. God's capable. We need him. He doesn't need us. You know, Naaman needed the cleansing, not God. God sets the terms of pardon. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you're going to do that on God's terms. God saves mankind by his grace through their faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of works. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you were to read through the Bible, what you would find is God's grace is always offered to mankind when man is in sin and in need. When man is incapable of helping himself, God extends his grace to man. Genesis 6 and verse number 8, the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Here's what else you'll find. Every time God gives his grace, you'll find commands immediately following. Because God demands that men obey him. And so grace leads to commands that is expressed by faith or trust, and then that ends in salvation. That's the way it always works. Instead of complaining when things go wrong, we should joy over what God has already done. You know what the Godhead has done for us is God has provided our cleansing. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. That Christ who came shed his blood for our sins. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The Holy Spirit is the one who revealed that will and that knowledge to man. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. You ever been in one of those relationships where somebody says, it's not you, it's not me, it's, it's, it's you, it's not you, it's me, and they, they try to let you down easy. Here's the thing to understand, it's not God, it's us. Because we approach God like Naaman. We have our thoughts, and then we try to fit God into them. We don't listen to God. We just demand that he listen to us. Thankfully for Naaman, there was somebody else to help him. And so we should learn from Naaman. 
Back to 2 Kings chapter 5. The Bible says this. Naaman eventually got over himself and submitted to God. He stopped trying to make God his servant. And he bent his knee, his knee and his will and his heart to God. Verse number 13. But his servant came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God and all of his company. And he came and he stood before him and he said, and friends, listen, verse 15 is what it was all about to begin with. There's about three verses as you walk through this chapter that really stand out. One, the little maid says, oh, that my master were with the prophet. Verse number eight, Elijah says, let him come to me and he will know there is a prophet in Israel. Let me ask you a question. What does a prophet do? If there is a prophet in Israel, that means that prophet speaks the word of God. Which means when you meet the prophet in Israel, you will hear the God who gives the word to the prophet. If he comes to the prophet, he'll find God. And after his cleansing, note the difference. Verse 15 says, then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. And he said, behold, I know that there is no, not prophet, there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from whom? Your servant. Naaman came and thinking and behaving as if God served him. Naaman left believing he served God. Friends, I submit to you, if you want what we'll talk about in the next session, our final session, a joy that can't be taken. If you want that, then you have to have eyes to see the spiritual and the humility of heart to see yourself serving God on his terms and not yours. Let's pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, to you we give all glory, honor, and praise. Father, it is amazing how much you love us and care for us it is absolutely, we, we stand in awe of how much you've committed to us, how much you've provided for us, how long you've been patient and long-suffering with humanity, and what you have provided in the person of Jesus. Father, we pray that we will bend our wills, submit our hearts and our minds, and be thankful and grateful that we can and be your servants. Father, you have blessed us so richly that you will also allow us to be your sons and your daughters, and we thank you for that. Bless us, strengthen us, keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Y'all can uh, come on in and find a seat. We will press ahead with our last, our last session. I do uh, want to just quickly, uh, we received a text from Chuck uh, Cardenas to update us on, on Laura. Uh, thanks everyone for the prayers. Uh, he said they're going to do a procedure to remove the clots in her lungs, a catheter style uh, procedure, so not a super invasive thing, and uh, probably are in the process of doing that now uh, based on the timing of the text. And so he appreciates the prayers and, and uh, asks that they continue, and so we certainly will do that. And he'll keep us updated, and we'll pass it along to you through the usual channels as we get more uh, information from him. David uh, is going to lead us uh, in another song or two, and at the appropriate time, John O'Dell will lead us in prayer uh, at the beginning of the service, and uh, David Webb uh, will lead us in prayer at the conclusion of the service. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's worship and study together. We'll sing uh, Marching to Zion here for the first song, and then after this song, uh, John will lead the opening prayer. If you don't mind, would you stand, please, as we sing? Let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for this beautiful day that you have given to us. We're thankful, Father, for life, for health, for every good and perfect blessing that we know comes from thee. This morning, Father, we come to you with Sister Laura Cardenas on our minds. We're aware, Father, of her condition. We know, Father, that you know her needs. We pray, Father, this morning for the doctors, for the nurses who are caring for her. And we pray, Father, if it be your will, for a full and speedy recovery. We're thankful, Father, for this weekend and this seminar that we have uh, been enjoying. We're so very thankful, Father, that Brother Owens has come our way. We're thankful for the messages that he has delivered, and we're thankful for the one that is yet to come. We pray, Father, that our hearts have been lifted, that we have been encouraged to find true happiness and contentment 
not in the passing things of this world, but in that which is true and lasting and eternal in a relationship with thee through thy son. We're so very thankful, Father, for uh, this congregation, for all the good things that she has done over the years and the good that she does even at, at this moment. We pray, Father, that um, that will always be the case and that will be the bright and shining example both to this community and to the world that, that we want to be. We're thankful, Father, again, for every blessing that you bestow upon us. But especially, Father, we're thankful for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Before the lesson, we'll sing, um, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Good morning. I'm excited about the last session. We finally got in there. I feel like you may not have found the joy yet. And so that's what my mother told me. Like, Eric, man, I know you're talking about joy, but I sure don't feel it yet. Well, this is the one. <laughs> A joy that can't be taken. Couldn't be happier for us the last to be here. How do we have a joy that can't be taken? The first thing we should note is what we're talking about is attainable. There are people in scripture who are identified as having it. A couple of examples come to mind. The blessed man in Psalm 1. If you were to read that psalm, you will hear the description is of the man, not of something he receives. It's him. And it describes him as blessed or happy. This thing is descriptive of the individual and then that psalm begins to express how he came to have it and what he does by way of sustaining it. Also what he avoids and what he does not do. They're both in the psalm and it lastly talks about those who can't have it. The wicked it says are not so. This man is a way the wicked are not. That's a person who has it. Another individual who has it, and there are many more, but Paul stands out as an individual who has it. If you read through the book of Philippians, it becomes very clear that his circumstances has not determined his joy. In fact, it has impeded it in no way at all, and he says as much. 
The question then is how can I, and better yet, do I have this joy that cannot be taken? Some things we should know and we've touched on already. We are spiritual beings in physical bodies. Happiness then can be only as lasting as the thing in which it is placed. And so it can last only as long as the thing is. If you put your happiness here, if that's what gives it to you, then you can have that happiness as long as you have that thing. But if that thing goes away, well, then so does your happiness. Secondly, happiness is only as secure as the thing in which you put it. What happens if that thing fails? What if it falls apart? What if somebody takes it away? This is the Lord's point. Moth and rust corrupts. You need to place your joy somewhere where these things don't happen to it. And for these reasons, our joy cannot be in anything physical. Physical things cannot satisfy our spiritual needs and our spiritual man. Physical things don't last. Physical things are not secure. The challenge then to understanding this concept is our thinking. It's important to remember as children of God, we are not at home here. In fact, we sing it, this world is not my home. And then we even say, with no reference to Abraham, with no reference to Sarah, we say, I'm just passing through. We go further and say, my treasures are laid up somewhere, but not here. They're beyond the blue. Let me ask you this. You aren't just going through the motions on that, are you? You aren't just singing that as that's the last song that was called by the song leader. And since I know that when I'll mouth these words, you're not doing that. Tell me you really do believe that but not just intellectually. Tell me, that's how you live here every day. We have lived among the world so long that over time we can begin to believe like the world. The problem is not that we wear their clothes. I know we talk about that sometimes, but that's not the problem. We got to wear something and they make them. The problem is not that we wear their clothes. The problem is not that we cut our hair the way they cut their hair. It's not even that we adopt their styles and celebrate the holidays. That's not the problem. It's not that we drive the same cars, have the same phones, play the same games. And if those things aren't the problem, what is the problem? I'll tell you, the problem is that we began to think like them. The problem is we began to believe like them. And inevitably, the problem is we began to behave like them. When you read passages like Romans chapter 12, do know this is what Paul is talking about. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed. Do not allow the world to mold you into them. Don't do that. Be not conformed. Instead, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't let them convince you to think like them. You think like God. Paul would say, as a result of this thinking, this world is not my home, except he would say, our citizenship is in heaven. So then, live like that. What else would he say? He would say, if then ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, listen to it, who is our life? When he shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We spent a large part of our time talking about material religion and why it fails. We turn our attention to the Lord's people now because that's not us, right? But let me ask, why are we then 
so often as miserable as the world. Why do then we feel so oppressed and depressed all the time? Why do we so often feel trapped and upset? Why is it that we don't have any more joy than they have? Why is our joy as fleeting and as passing as theirs? I submit to you, friends, Christians simply have to be. We just have to be the most joyous people in the world. Because if we are not, then pray tell who can be. If we read all of the Bible, there is one reason that stands out for our joy. And that one reason stands out above all others. In fact, every other reason you could come up with as to why a Christian should have joy, it will inevitably go back to this one reason. And that one reason is Christ. If you were to sit down and start writing out reasons one could have joy, maybe some of the qualifications or the thoughts would be things like a purpose beyond yourself, a, a peace that could see you through any challenge, a, a, a powerful self-assurance in every circumstance, a positivity, a positive certainty of every need met. A people who loves you no matter what happens and approval from God. And if those are the things that would give one a joy that couldn't be taken, in six passages, the Apostle Paul says Christ provides every single one of them. In the book of Philippians, six passages, chapter 3 and verse number 20, Paul says, for our conversation, you need a purpose beyond yourself. Our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This world is not our home. There's a purpose beyond us. What about a peace? Verse number seven of chapter four, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. A peace that could see you through any challenge. Philippians 4 and verse number 13, I can do all things, not some, not many, not most. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, a powerful self-assurance in every circumstance, absolutely. What about chapter 4 and verse 19? But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. How? By Christ Jesus, you need a positive certainty of every need met in Christ. Chapter 4 and verse 21, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you, a people who love you no matter what and are accepting God's provided that in his church. What about approval from God? That's how the book ends. Chapter 4 and verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. If you are in Christ, then you have a joy that cannot be taken. And here's why. Reason number one, because God loves you. If you'll turn to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, the apostle of love will talk about the God of love. And in verse number 7 of chapter 4, he will say these words, Beloved, let us love one another. Why would we do that? For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. When we talk about God's love, it's important to let it be about God. That's who it's about. When we speak of God's love, we're speaking about God. And yet somehow God's own children seem to go wrong. How do we do it? Well, we go wrong probably and most frequently in the beginning. How often do we leave Genesis chapter 3? And what is it that we leave the garden with? We leave the garden with a mean, punitive, judging God. That's how we leave. 
After all, the close of that chapter is God put them out. That's kind of the way we work with God. And yet, we don't leave with a loving God who didn't kill them and said in verse 15, he would die for them. That the seed of woman would come. That very God said that in verse 15. And he put them out of the garden. Why? He's a loving God. You see, he said if they eat of this tree, they'll live forever. How? In sin. God's grace actually is going to allow them to die physically so he can redeem them spiritually and eternally. You can't bring sin to heaven. No, but we don't leave with a loving God. We leave with a mean, vindictive God. And this begins to shape our concept of love. It boils down something like this. When I do well, that is, when I obey, I'm loved. When I do bad, I disobey, well, I'm not loved. You grow up in homes, you have relationship, and this concept is reinforced over and over again. And before you know it, that's your definition of love. You do well, you're loved. You do bad, you're not loved. And yet, that's not the Bible's definition of love at all. You see, when you learn God, you learn love. In fact, if you read 1 John 4, 7 through 10, at some point, John will say this, God is love. He doesn't say God gives love, although he does say that too, because he says, in this was manifested the love of God. But he says more specifically, God is love. You see, when you learn God, you learn what love is. And hopefully that becomes your definition. Well, let's learn God. You have your Bibles. Look at Exodus chapter 34. And while you're turning there, I should tell you a little bit about chapter 33. In chapter 33, Moses asked God to show me your glory. In other words, Moses says to God, tell me who you are. I want to know you. Somebody might ask, and I would think a very natural and normal question. How does Moses not know God? After all, who would know God better than Moses? If you go back to Exodus chapter 3, when they're introduced, God says to Moses, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But in the very chapter, verse number 14, Moses says, who shall I say sent me? What is your name? Who are you? He still doesn't know. And if you keep progressing through the book, what you'll find is God does, or Moses does, become to know something about God. But what he knows about God is his power. He has seen it on display. He has seen the bush burning, not consumed. He's been given the signs, three of them, the rod to a serpent and in his hand to leprosy and then the water of blood. He saw that. And a little bit later, Moses is going to see the ten plagues up close and personal. He has seen the power of God. But go a little further and get over to chapter 14, and Moses will be the one that raises his staff and the sea parts, and they walk through on dry land. Moses saw that up close and personal. In fact, go a little further, and Moses will get the water, and he'll get the manna, and eventually he'll stand on the mount. Hear and see the thunder and the lightning of the God of heaven. And yet, in chapter 33, Moses says, I don't know you. Well, why doesn't Moses know him? He knows God's power. What he doesn't know is God's character. I don't know the character that wields that power. I want to know you. It's a wonderful section of scripture because in chapter 34, God talks about himself. It's a sort of rare occurrence in Scripture, but it does happen here. And God says to Moses, I'll tell you who I am. Now, friends, if this is not your understanding of God, then you're misunderstanding your father. And that is why you have a joy that seems to be able to be taken, because if you know him, you'll know it can't be. In Exodus 34, what does God say about himself? Begin reading in verse number 5 and listen. The Bible says, The Lord descended in the clouds. He stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sins, yet he will by no means clear the guilty, leave them unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children, on the grandchildren, to the third and fourth generation. And so many people read that, miss the first 8, 10, 12 descriptions, and they immediately jump to the last one. You see, he said it, he won't clear the guilty, but did you miss everything else? Did you not hear him say he's loving and kind and merciful? Here's the thing to understand about God. If, if, if love were a box, then all of those things go into it. Love is as multifaceted as God is. Because the scripture says God is love. What does that mean? It means whatever he is, he is that eternally. 
And whatever love means, God is the one who defines it. And here is what that means. It means love never meant I approve of your actions. It never meant that. It was never the definition. In fact, God loved Cain, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, but he did not approve of his actions. But he loved him. Love never meant I don't judge you. Love never meant that. That's how our world defines it. It's not how you should define it. Love can't mean that because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and yet by Genesis 6 and verse 8, God is going to judge the world. Love never meant I don't judge. It never meant that. Love never meant I don't give you commands. Exodus chapter 20, God loved Israel. They were his chosen special people, Exodus 19, 4 through 6, and yet God gave the law. He gave commands. In fact, Deuteronomy 10 and verse number 13, Moses will say that law was given for your good. God loved them, and yet he gave them commands. Love never meant I don't discipline you. In fact, according to Hebrews 12, 5, and 6, it would mean the opposite. If he didn't discipline, he wouldn't love us, but the fact that he does discipline is an indication that he loves us. People sometimes say, well, we aren't worthy of God's love. People say things like, we don't do anything to earn God's love. People say, we, God doesn't owe us anything. I think I understand what they're trying to say, but I don't agree. I believe we do. I believe, and that biblically, we are worthy of God's love and we deserve God's love. And I say that in the same way and as much in a new baby deserves his parents' love. Would you say the baby deserves it? Would you say the baby is worthy of it? Two parents have a child. They bring the child home and somebody says, well, that, that baby, they don't owe that baby nothing, don't they? That baby doesn't deserve something for them, doesn't he? Baby didn't make himself. He didn't decide to come into the world. You know, the truth is, we didn't either. No, no. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. God decided to make us. How do we not deserve to be loved as his children then? God's love for you is about God. It's not even about what you do. We are not talking about humanity's love for one another. It often fails. We aren't talking about people who suffer trauma themselves and then have trouble giving and receiving love, not what we're talking about. We aren't talking about people who manipulate or narcissistic, codependent, and do all of this stuff and yet use the word love. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about God and his love, and God is perfect, and God is love. In fact, as scripture seeks to explain that to us, and why it provides a joy that can be taken is the very reasons that the scripture gives. Three things the Bible says, and we should know about God's love. Number one, God loved you before he made you. Absolutely, he did. First John 4 and verse number 8, the Bible says God is love. But the Bible doesn't simply say God is love. You know what else the Bible says? The Bible says from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalm 91 and 2. God is eternal. That God is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. That God has no beginning and God has no end. And if God is eternal and God is love, let me ask you this. What was God before he made the world? In the beginning, God. Well, what was God? According to John, of all the things God is, God is love. That means before there was a man on the earth, God was already love. There wasn't anybody to love, and yet God is love because love is about who God is, not about what you do. God loved you before. Somebody say, well, Eric, I don't agree with that. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have any children? If you have a child, let me ask you, when did you start loving them? I trust it was not when you found out you were pregnant. I trust you said, we're pregnant. Yes, but hold on, don't get excited. Don't, 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 don't get excited. We're going to hold our judgments. We're going to decide later whether or not we're going to love. Based on what? Well, we'll see if they're able to crawl. If they crawl successfully, then we'll give them our love. Well, no, they crawled, but then they fell. Let me tell you what, we walk in this house, and... Uh, Crawlers just don't get it done here, sir. Well, they walk, but they can't run. Oh, have mercy. You know, you can't run. Listen, they stumble, they fall. Oh, they didn't do, listen, tell you what, 
If you're going to crawl around here and not be able to walk and run, you get your little backpack and get out because we only love people. That's what you did, right? There's no way you loved your child before your child could do anything for you. There's no way you did that. And yet we somehow think God can't. God loved you before he even made you because God is love. It's important to understand you can't move God to love you because God loved you before you could move. God's love is about his character, not your behavior. God loves you because he made you. Doesn't need another reason. Psalm 103 and verse number three, the Bible says, Know ye not that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, not we ourselves. We are his sheep and the sheep of his pasture. We are his offspring, Acts 17, 28. He doesn't need another reason to love you. He loves you because he made you. You share his image. God loves you. Thirdly, God loves you when? He loves you before. He loves you because. He loves you when? Well, when does he love you? He loves you when you were in sin. Surely God will not love us when we were in sin. I did not say God loves sin. I said God loves you. And you were in sin when Jesus came. God so loved the world. What was the state of the world when he gave his only begotten son? Oh, the world was perfect. Well, if it were perfect, it didn't need Jesus. Romans 5 and verses 6 through 8. While we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. What does that mean? That means God loved you when you were in sin. That's what that means, because love is about God, not about you. And since God is love, he loved you when you were in sin, which is why he sent Jesus in the first place. God doesn't just love you when you do right. God loves you when? Well, God loves you when? Through every cycle of your life. In Luke 15, God loved the boy when he was at home. In Luke 15, God loved the boy when he went away from home. He didn't approve of his actions because love doesn't mean that. But he was in the pig's pen. God loved him. When he came home, God loved him. When did God stop loving him? He didn't. Because God is love. Why do you have a joy that can't be taken? Because God loves you. And nobody can take that away. You have a love that can't be taken because time and chance happens to us all. Sometimes people struggle with God because suffering enters into their life. And wherever they put their joy, then when they suffer, that thing is hit or harmed or somehow impacted and their joy goes along with it. And yet God is the one telling us that's not where your joy is because if you live on the earth, time and chance will happen. To us all, there are any number of reasons why we suffer in this world. Among them are our own choices. Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 8. Cain was rejected because of Cain's choices. The second reason is natural disaster. Storms, weather, wind, hurricanes, earthquakes. It happens ultimately traced all the way back to man's disobedient and the flood ultimately and its changing of the world. Genesis 12, 10, Luke 15, 4, the 14, the, the tower fell. It, it happens. And then there's the choices of others. You know, Cain suffered because of his own choices and then Abel suffered because of Cain's choices. Sometimes people harm us. They have choices too. And sometimes those choices cause us harm. But our joy is not in any of those things. Remember, our joy is in Christ. And you know what Christ told us in his first address? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, he says this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, that's you, the one who hears the sayings and does them. You know what Jesus says? I will liken him unto a wise man. Why is he wise? He built his house upon the rock. Well, that settled it, right? Nothing will ever happen because he built his house on the rock. That's not what the Lord said. Why is he a wise man? Jesus said he's wise because he built his house on me. Then what happened? The rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew. And what did it do? It beat on the house. Why does he have joy? Because it fell not. You ever been outside in the rain and in the hail and so forth and so on and then get into the house and then not be rained on? That's Jesus. It can be raining outside, not on me. 
It can be wind blowing in there. You know what? The house stands. The joy is in the house standing, not in the rain, not falling. Jesus said, this is a wise man. Instead of placing your joy on sinking sand, place it in the rock. Life and people, and you and I should firmly etch this in our minds, life and people didn't treat Jesus right. Life and people didn't treat the apostles right. Life and people won't treat the righteous right. And yet Jesus had peace and joy in his life. And yet Paul had joy and peace in his life. Writing from prison after being beaten, praying and singing at midnight, the Apostle Paul wrote from the jail, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know where Paul's joy wasn't. It wasn't in his freedom because that's been taken. It wasn't in his physical health because that body has been beaten. Where was it? It wasn't in his location because now he's in a prison. Where is your joy, Paul? It's in the Lord. And who's with me in this prison? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Why can't they get to Paul? Because they can't get to his joy. It's out of their reach. Later in the book, he would say, and the peace of God. How can Paul possibly have joy and peace in a prison after being beaten, falsely accused? How can he have joy and peace? Because it's in Christ. Our life circumstances does not determine our peace. It does not determine our joy. Our life circumstances does not cast reflection on God's character or God's love for us. Our joy is in Christ. Would you please never lose sight of this fact? God's goodness is not determined by the circumstances of our lives. God's goodness is determined by God's character. Rather, we should learn from Paul's example. I urge you to read through the book of Philippians. You will find things like this. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul says he sought an opportunity to serve even in suffering. Brethren, the things that have fallen out unto me have fallen out unto the furtherance of the gospel. In that circumstance, Paul sought an opportunity to shine the light of God, even in suffering. He says, the things that have fallen out to me have fallen out to the furnace of the gospel. And those in the prison, everybody in the praetorium guard, you know what? They know why I'm here. Paul, what are you doing? I'm shining my light in the dungeon. I'm shining my light in suffering. You know what else he did? Paul says, let me take this as an opportunity to encourage the brethren. That would be verse 14. He says, and many of the brethren have become bold. They've gained courage. From what? From me and the way I've handled this suffering. The brethren who are on the outside are looking at the way I've behaved inside and they have taken courage. You know what they know now? They can come in here and be like Jesus. You and I should learn to rejoice in whatever state we find ourselves in. You know, people say God is good and then they say all the time, really, do you mean it? Is God good when you're in prison, Paul? God is good. Is God good when you're beaten, Paul? God is good. Is God good when you suffer loss? God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. There is no circumstance of life that can take away your joy when your joy is in God. There's no power on earth that can remove you from God's hand. Romans chapter 8 and verse 38 down to verse 39. Who shall separate us from the love of God? You name it, it's too weak. You name it, doesn't have enough power. You name it, doesn't have enough reach. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God except one person. And so we should say what the Hebrew writer said. Let us boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Your joy can't be taken because of how God thinks about you. Have you thought about it? Just stop and ask yourself, what does God think of me? Spend some time on what God thinks rather than keep asking the world to like you. They won't. Stop asking the world to be your friend and to think so highly of you. They won't. Stop asking the world to make you happy and let you fit in. You don't want to fit in. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. Instead, ask, what does God 
think of me. And he'll tell you. All you got to do is read Psalm 8. Start at verse 3. Read down to verse number 8. And you'll read things like this. When I consider the heavens, the work of your hand, it's as if someone is asking God, maybe an angel, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And then the one talking goes in to begin to describe what God has done. And so he says something like this. What is man that thou art mindful of him? He then says, you have made him a little lower than the angels. Did you know that? God thinks that of you. Made you a little lower than the angels. Next time you're wondering, what's my worth? Go see God. He'll tell you. You're a little lower than the angels. But then he goes on. He says, you have crowned him with glory and honor. That's not superficial or made up. The one speaking said, God did that. God crowned you with glory and honor. And then he goes on to say, you trust him. Why do you do that? You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. He didn't put it in the hands of angels. He put it in the hands of humans. You've given him, you trust him like that? Have you ever noticed all of God's great plans trusted to humanity? Noah, build the ark. Adam, name the animals. Abram, come out of Ur. Moses, go deliver my people. Twelve men, take this gospel to the whole world. You trust them? Absolutely, I trust them. Satan, Job will curse you to your face. I'll take that challenge. Go ahead, do your best. How do we end the book? Job and God made friends. He didn't curse him. No, you trust them? Absolutely, I do. You put all things under his feet? Absolutely. Your joy can't be taken because of how God thinks of you. But then thirdly, your joy can't be taken because you've been redeemed. You've been redeemed. We're not talking about people who aren't. Christians? We're talking about those who have been redeemed. Now here's the problem. The devil and his minions will try to convince you to think less of yourself than you ought to. They will try to rob you of your joy by reminding you of your past. They'll just keep bringing it up and you'll just find yourself in conversation sometimes with your own self. You're the only one talking to you. And you'll be saying things like, well, there's all this self-doubt. I know what I used to do, and I, I, I'm not good enough, and I'm not going to do this, and there's no way I can. And, God, and you just put your head down and just talk yourself into a pitiful state. The next time it happens, and I mean the next time it happens, I tell you what you do. Throw them a curveball and agree with them. Yeah. Next time, the, the devil, doubt, Something creeps into your mind and starts telling you what you've done and how you're a fraud and how you're fake and how you come here to put on a show. Just tell them, yep, I was. I was used up. I was beat down with sin, yes. I was like the boy in the pig pen con contemplating eating a meal. Yep, sin hurt my soul, it damaged my mind, it turned me against myself. Yes, yes, and yes, sin caused me and those I love much pain and suffering mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And yes, sin had me struggling with addictive behavior. So yes, I wanted the hurting to stop. I wanted to quiet my mind. I tried other things. I wanted to feel better. I wanted to find the joy. I wanted to forget what I've done and who I had become. I wanted to be happy, and so I reached for things to make me feel better. I reach for things to numb the pain and dull my senses. And I learned to reach for those things over and over again. I found they gave me short-term comfort, but it wore off quickly. And so I had to reach again and again and again. And before long, I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. In this state, some people reach for food, some for alcohol, some for pleasure or drugs. Some for possessions and cars and clothes and shoes and houses. Some for entertainment and games and sports and gambling. Go ahead and agree with them and say, yes, absolutely. And after all of the agreement, you do this. After all of the discouraging self-talk and after all of the remembering of the past, after all of the shame and guilt that we become so comfortable with wearing, then say, but. There's something you should know. You tell the devil, 
Tell the doubt. Tell yourself, but now I'm singing a new song. You tell them the words to the song. It goes something like this. Sweet is the song I'm singing today. Yeah, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Troubles and sorrow have vanished away. I have been redeemed. Tell them the good news of Jesus and tell them how you learn through God that his grace reaches me. Tell them I'm redeemed and his grace reaches me and it will last until eternity. And tell them you're talking about the past, but now I'm under his control and I'm happy in my soul. And you tell them, yes, his grace reaches me. Tell them I know that my redeemer lives. Tell them Jesus paid it all. Tell them that he paid the price. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Tell them, I hear what you're doing, but it's not going to work. See, you're trying to convince a saved man that he's lost. I'm not lost. You're trying to convince a man bound for heaven that he's still bound for hell. I know where I'm going. Tell them, you're trying to take a joy that cannot be taken. Why can't it be taken? Because my life is hidden in Christ, and I'm complete in him. You tell him and them and anyone and anything that tries to bring up your past, your former life to remind you, to hold you back, to rob you of your joy, even if it's you. You tell them, for the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed in. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You see, you have a joy. It cannot be taken because you have been redeemed. But you have a joy that can't be taken because your name is written in heaven and you're going to heaven. Please tell me when you sing these songs you mean them. Please tell me you're not just mouthing the words. Please tell me when you hear and sing, won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. The Bible teaches Jesus came from heaven. He went back to heaven, and he's coming from heaven to take us to heaven. That's why your joy can't be taken. John says this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that not hath the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. In Christ, you have a joy that cannot be taken. Because of Christ, God loves you. God has redeemed you. There is no amount of time and chance in life that can change that. God thinks so highly of you. And heaven is your home. When Peter talks about our relationship with God, Peter makes the case that what we have is out of the reach of the world. And so this joy that we have cannot be taken. Peter says it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to it. To an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. And it's as if, if you've ever been somewhere where you wanted to keep something from a little child and you take it and you put it up on the top shelf and you can go about freely living because you know they can't get to it. It's beyond their reach. There's this, it's safe. I took it and I put it up there. You know what Peter says? This uncorruptible, undefiled, imperishable inheritance. He said God took it and put it 
in heaven for you. He reserved it in heaven. You know the arms of the world is too short to get to it. The trials of life can't reach it. The circumstances of life can't assail it. It's reserved in heaven for you, and it is kept by the power of God. If you are in Christ, you have a joy that cannot be taken. Pray to God. We don't live as if it can. If there is any people on this earth who should be joyous, it's those people who are in Christ. If you're not a Christian, friends, there is nothing else anybody could offer you on the earth better than becoming one. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. Allow that belief to move you to change your mind. Stop seeing the material. This world is not all there is. The physical world will pass away. That's not it. Begin to see the spiritual Allow godly sorrow to lead you to repent, to change your mind, change the course of your life. Confess the name of Jesus. Stand and shout it to the world. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I want to live for him. You know what God does next. He takes that old man, and he buries him, and then he rises, and you get to be a new creation that's why the mind changes. The person in Christ is not like the person before. This is an old man. This is a new man. That man has a joy. Not in anything physical. It cannot be taken. Friends, if you've never done that, we beg you to do that. But if you are his child, have you ever seen you ever seen a child, or can you imagine? A child, this is how it works in my mind. Do you remember that toy where there was a paddle, a string, and a ball? Do you remember that one? I want you to imagine a child trying to play with that. I mean, he hits it, he misses it, and he sits in the house in the living room floor and he keeps playing with this ball he's missing sometimes he's hidden sometimes now right over here is a door and inside of the door is fao schwartz's toy store also in the house But all he does is play with it. Far too many Christians, sum total of their Christianity is this. And in their father's house is all of the spiritual blessings in Christ. They'll never grow to know there is a joy that cannot be taken in Christ. They will instead play miserably in the house. Don't let that be your time here. Don't let that be your walk. God's word, God's people, prayer, service, the life that God has provided rich, abundant, and lasting. But you might be tempted to let everything take your joy. If you're in Christ, you have a joy that cannot be taken. My prayer is that you will live it to the glory of God.
we can help you in any way, we invite you to come. Are we singing? As we sing. Sorrow and night, Jesus, I come. take uh, just a moment to thank all of you for, uh, for coming this morning and uh, for all of those that came to the other sessions as much as you were able, those that joined us online. Uh, thank you for doing that. Hope that this has been uh, something beneficial to you and I know that it has been, it's certainly been beneficial to me uh, and uh, Eric, we're indebted to you, brother, uh, for coming and, and challenging us and encouraging us. Uh, um, it's just been a, a, a tremendous uh, three days, and we're grateful, grateful that you came. We wish you and Miss Vanessa Godspeed uh, in your travels and in your work, and wish you well at, at Westside and Round Rock, and come see us again. And uh, if you're visiting with us today, we invite you, come see us again at any opportunity you have. Uh, if you would, please stand. Uh, one of our elders, David Webb, is going to come and Dismiss us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for all the blessings you do give to us. We're certainly thankful for the time together that we've had. We thank you for Thursday night. We thank you for Friday night. We thank you for this morning. Lord, please help us consciously, subconsciously, the way we live, to never believe or think that we, uh, that you serve us. We pray that we can always live and, and think consciously, subconsciously, that um, our purpose here is to serve you. And we thank you for the lessons this morning. We thank you for that joy that can't be taken away through Jesus Christ we're just thankful we're thankful for this church home and the families that we uh, have relationships with here we pray for uh, continued prayer for the Cardenas family this morning and be with Laura she goes through her procedures this morning and Lord through all that we pray for their faith and that their faith is strengthened through this and we pray that for all of us as we go through trials that we can fully understand uh, the joy of being a Christian 
and the happiness that we hold it can't be taken away that, that we're thankful for that and that we understand that as a church body as individuals as Christians pray for the Owens as they travel back today and be with us all it's your son's name that we pray amen